Demonstrating their complete inability to engage with or even, frankly, enjoy any media on any level, there was massive, in quotes, controversy about the latest episode of Doctor Who from conservatives who are watching Wild Blue Yonder. Because the opening scene, the first two minutes of the episode, take place in 1666 with Sir Isaac Newton, who was the guy who did not invent gravity, because gravity is a force. Gravity is, more specifically, it is a theory. And Isaac Newton is the one who came up with the theory. And he was portrayed in the first two minutes of the episode by Nathaniel Curtis, who you may remember playing Ash in Russell T. Davis's It's a Sin. He discovered, yeah, the force, it's the theory. It's a force. This is, folks, this is the correct terminology, okay? I'm a science guy. You can trust me. You can trust me on this, okay? So he was played by Nathaniel Curtis in the story. This is literally a two-minute preamble to set the joke that he mishears the word gravity, says mavity instead, and then when the word gravity should be said about three or four times over the course of the 50-minute story, they say mavity instead. It's tying into the theme that humans are weird and can believe two contradictory things at once, where gravity is mavity, because at one point the Doctor even properly corrects himself. And also, when David Tennant is giving an incredible performance, reacting to the flux and the trauma of the Chibnall era, that's the metatext, I guess, his performance is just full of such intense mavitas. There we go. There's the pun. But yeah, Nathaniel Curtis, small role, but a fun one. The Doctor and Donna crash into the apple tree and then change history inadvertently. So, the best headline ever, Doctor Who upsets conservatives as Isaac Newton played by person of colour. Now, Nathaniel Curtis has one white parent and their other parent is Indian, which makes him, like, biracial. He's, he's half Asian. So, the you know, Isaac Newton basically perceived normally by history as whiter than the driven snow, whiter than vanilla ice music, but that's fine because it's Doctor Who. It's a fun, strange blue box show. And also Isaac Newton did not call it Mavity. The Doctor and Donna did not crash into the apple tree. We're not dealing with a historical document here. We're watching a fun blue box show for children, which I described in what I will call a banger tweet, which has been seen by 1.2 million people, 21,000 likes, Isaac Newton wasn't Asian, you're right, but Charles Dickens didn't blow up ghosts, Agatha Christie didn't fight off a giant wasp, Mary Seacole didn't treat Sontarans, Van Gogh didn't stab an invisible chicken, it's Doctor Who, get a grip, and they say where the snowflakes. This tweet was actually featured in The Independent, this is Indy 100, an offshoot of The Independent. So, folks, I've made it, and you know I've made it, but it was actually earlier on today, that I discovered that this was mentioned on the Jeremy Vine show, aka actual proper legit broadcast TV on Monday morning, hosted by Jeremy Vine, who, for those of you who don't know, because you might be internet pilled or you might be outside of the UK, is one of the biggest names in TV hosting in this country. He hosts regular radio shows on the BBC. He's got his own show on Channel 5. Jeremy Vine on 5, the official channel. And they talk about this. This is an officially uploaded segment on the channel, which you might not believe because the weird, like there's weird anti-aliasing on the video and there's weird motion blur, but whatever. This was sent to me on the Discord server a few hours ago. This is from Monday morning and it's Tuesday afternoon that I discovered that my tweet is not only shown on TV and read out by Jeremy Vine, but that he might have actually slandered me. Let's play the clip. It's two and a half minutes. My tweet isn't there until like the last 40 or 50 seconds. But let's look at the context here. I don't know if either of you have caught this weekend's Doctor Who, right? It's compelling because it's the 60th anniversary series of specials, the three of them. And it's got David Tennant back in the role of the Doctor. And some of the storylines have got people talking online. Let's see. Was it me or was Isaac Newton hot? He was. I skipped that because of copyright stuff, but we'll carry on. There's a little bit of a thing going on of, does that mean the Doctor's gay because he finds Isaac Newton hot? Oh, no. he's just a man crush. Girls have girl crushes. Because <laughs> you and I, Wilfred, man well, to man, we could occasionally say that person's hot. Yeah, yeah we? we can, but, you know, when I was a kid, I always found Doctor Who uh, confusing. 
I must say, now that I'm six to six, I'm still finding it confusing. You mean the whole it, thing or the sexuality of the doctor? Well, the whole thing. It, okay. seems, it, it seems that... Um, it... <laughs> this guy understands Doctor Who. Like, look, I'm not even, like, joking or being flippant here. This guy gets it. It, it has a licence to do anything that, yes, th that it, it wants, has. really. That's what fiction is, yeah. Wilfred. Yeah, but, I mean, to, to the, to, to, it's got to be somehow you could grasp it to think actually it makes sense, but it got to the point where it's totally illogical. But the, so there's obviously there's a bit of some of the people on Twitter with all the flags and everything are kind of cross that the doctor might be gay. Let's have a look at the hot... <laughs> By the flags, I'm assuming he means people with, like, Union Jack flags and stuff. I, that's my best guess, but anyway, right. Isaac Newton, all right... Oh, that's a picture of me with Isaac. So look, I'm on the, the left. Is hot, then. You are <laughs> so, so just by chance, they've put a photo. People are constantly telling me I look like Isaac. Newton. And you, you do, that. actually. I can see yeah. the likeness. So I then try to do a... So he's in the background, just to make it clear. Right. And I don't know how hot he is. But there's also then the, the actor playing Isaac Newton. I, and we might have yeah. some pictures of that. The where, where I don't know. There's there's then again a bit of a thing of of um, is the actor the right person to do it? And you know, look, I'm really struck about how much you do look like him. Have you done your DNA test or anything like to see that? <laughs> <laughs> like, there's what in that picture. There's the look. Yeah, so so this there. is a classic. Have a look at this. This is Mr. Tardis. Isaac Newton wasn't Asian. You're right. Charles Dickens didn't blow up ghosts. Agatha Christie didn't fight off a giant wasp, etc. So they're, they're upset about the ethnicity of the actor playing oh. Isaac. It's it. There's all these rows get exhausted. I just don't care, and I just want to enjoy it. The yeah. best person for the job. Exactly. The best person. Exactly. I mean, okay. I agree with Jeremy's sentiment. For those who are wondering, is he just some stupid conservative reactionary? In my experience, Jeremy Vine isn't. He's a guy who's awkwardly stuck in places where he very, very, very frequently has to play devil's advocate. I remember his coverage during the RMT rail strikes last year, where he was just repeating statements from the government verbatim. To play devil's advocate, even when things that the government was saying about the strikes and the impact they would have were categorically incorrect and not issuing corrections. So that's that's the type of fence sitting punditry that we're dealing with for Jeremy Vine. OK, just so you folks, we're kind of setting the scene here. So, yeah, but the whole, you know, you just get, get the best actor for the role. I do think that that's, a, you know, still not a great argument because it just so happens. Oh, the great the best actor for the role just so happens to always be the straight cis white dude, you know. Whatever. The sentiment, I could, you know, the sentiment and living in an ideal world, I get that sentiment. And it seems like Jeremy Vine agrees. He just wants to enjoy the fun Blue Box show. But he get he's halfway through reading my tweet. And people in the chat have picked this up as well. It seems like he's lumped me in with the people who didn't like the casting of Nathaniel Curtis, even though I'm categorically defending him here. Dickens didn't blow up ghosts, Agatha Christie didn't fight off a giant wasp, etc. So they're, they're upset about the ethnicity of the actor play. So I think, basically, this is live TV, this isn't scripted, I don't hold anything personally against Jeremy Vine, of course. He says they are angry on Twitter and stuff. I think he's just talking about general outrage that this tweet is responding to. But, like, we, we said it here, like... I don't think that Jeremy has been well briefed by the producers who work on the Jeremy Vine show. Listen to how he introduces the first picture. ...and everything, a kind of cross that the doctor might be gay. Let's have a look at the hot Isaac Newton. Right. He's expecting a photo of the hot Isaac Newton, and that appears. He wasn't prepared for this segment, and he's expecting a photo of the hot Isaac Newton, and instead one of my tweets appears. So he's like, okay, this is on the screen. I better read it. I don't understand what he's saying. I don't watch Doctor Who or whatever. I'm, I'm assuming this is what's going through his mind. So I think that he just gets bored halfway through, doesn't understand who I'm talking about or what this is in reference to, and then just thinks, whatever, I'm halfway through this tweet. Get me out of here. Look at this. This is Mr. Tardis. Isaac Newton wasn't Asian, you're right. Charles Dickens didn't blow up ghosts. Agatha Christie didn't fight off a giant wasp, etc. So they're, they're upset about the... They're upset, does he mean you're upset? From the wording, he seems to imply that I'm upset. Even though this is, like I said, probably the most viral tweet talking about it. It's been seen by over a million people. It would have been around a million people by the time that this segment was broadcast live on Channel 5. And it just seems that... 
Jeremy Vine misrepresented or misunderstood what I was saying. But I do think that even though he has misrepresented the tweet, I don't blame Jeremy for this. I just think he was kind of poorly briefed on this particular topic by the producers who wanted to talk about this to prepare the images. He wasn't even prepared for his own face appearing on screen for the comparison for Isaac Newton. So it just kind of shows how unprepared he was. However, it just seems a bit interesting that they can't sort of show or broadcast any of the conservative anger and outrage on Monday morning on Channel 5 to regard in regards to Nathaniel Curtis's casting as Isaac Newton, probably because the stuff that they would have to show could not be broadcast on a Monday morning. They'd get told off by Ofcom. Now, it's very clearly seems like an accident and the fault of the behind the scenes people just kind of... Fun. It is kind of funny. It, it, like, I, I don't hold any ill will towards Jeremy Vine. Interestingly, though, when I posted this clip on Twitter, like an hour or two before going live, I tagged... Not Jeremy Vine himself. I, I tagged the show because there's a Jeremy Vine official Channel 5 Twitter account. And they actually responded. And not only did they respond, they followed me on Twitter... So, I posted the clip. Mike says, how the hell did he misread the sentiment of that tweet so badly? And then Jeremy Vine on 5, the official account, says, to be fair, it's interesting watching the misreading of the reading of the tweet all very meta. Watching the misreading of the reading of the tweet, implying that Mike misread Jeremy Vine's misreading. And before you think that this is just the Jeremy Vine Twitter account just going off and having a girl boss moment or whatever on social media, go to their account. Like I said, they follow me now. They followed me after I posted this. Go to their replies section and you'll see how rarely they reply to tweets. This is uh, from Tuesday Morning Show, Tuesday Morning Show, Tuesday Morning Show. This is just them re-uploading clips and posting stories. Smoking, cracking down on migrants to the NHS, license fee be sacked. My response, the response they did, is a massive outlier for this account, at least in terms of its recent history. You have to scroll down quite a bit to find a non official PR marketing one. There was one earlier, one second. Yeah, they responded a couple of days ago to a tweet asking why did he delete why did he delete the original post with a photo of oprah and they said hi remote editorial choice to better represent the story given the subject matter isn't the interview where the subject came to light but the subject itself usually when we delete it a typo and then it just goes on and on again as normal so the fact that this is like an official tv twitter account and then they one of their very few responses is them replying to somebody and then seemingly misrepresenting what they're responding to. As I responded, meta is a very interesting way to describe it. I understand that things can be misconstrued on live TV, but it'd be nice to know if Jeremy thought I was complaining about the casting or defending it. My link tree is here for contact info. And then I link the link tree so that people can email me if they want to. Because I'm absolutely happy to chat with them about this or to be a docu who expert on channel five or whatever if they want to talk about stuff for the giggle i don't know how it's meta but the fact that the official jeremy vine twitter account seems to think that jeremy thought i was having outrage at the casting of nathaniel curtis when i'm openly defending him very strange weird i don't get it anyway this tweet has had over a thousand replies and comments to it. I've gone through almost all of them. And honestly, out of like 1,000 comments and responses, the amount of good arguments against the casting of Nathaniel Curtis in this context as Isaac Newton is a big fat zero. This is a massive nothing burger in terms of controversy. Now, if this was Isaac Newton is guest starring in a full-blown hour-long episode of TV whatever okay maybe they'd have a point but in a two minute throwaway opening scene where the gag is actually isaac newton discovered the theory of mavity because the doctor and donna crashed their tardis into the apple tree i think that we're allowed to have a little bit of fun here 
And like I said, Charles Dickens did not blow up ghosts. Agatha Christie did not fight off a giant wasp. Mary Seacole did not treat Sontarans. Van Gogh didn't stab an invisible chicken. There is dispute about this one, but you know, let me have my point. So to cast Nathaniel Curtis, an actor that Rusty Davis has worked with before, who trusts with a role like this, a fun little throwaway pre-titles cameo, it's fine in this context as far as I'm aware. And also, I wasn't aware that the theory of gravity was something that was heavily racialized. And when people say, actually, Doctor Who in the past, those examples that you've cited, they look just like their actual historical versions. I hate to break it to you folks, but sometimes Doctor Who messes around with appearance as well. Here is an artist rendering of William Shakespeare. There we go. Strange hairstyle, but you know, bisexual icon William Shakespeare. We're fine. Style changes. Here's how he's depicted. In the Shakespeare Code... Giga Chad Energy, appearance and accurate representation of a celebrity's appearance in Doctor Who historicals is something that the show can play fast and loose with. Doesn't look like his portraits. Yeah, this is actually lampshaded in the episode itself. They always yesify them. They do to an extent. Now, obviously, you're never ever going to get a perfect one-to-one -one depiction of a historical celebrity, especially a historical celebrity who was around pre-photographs. You know, these. this is an artist's depiction of William Shakespeare. Maybe he really did... What, what's the actor's name? Shakespeare Code Actor. What's his name? This is me quickly typing. Who plays him in that? Dean Lennox Kelly. You know, maybe in reality, William Shakespeare did look like Dean Lennox Kelly. Oh. Guys, I think I fancy William Shakespeare a bit. Ooh la la. Uh, sorry, stay on target. Maybe William Shakespeare did look like Dean Lennox Kelly. You know, who knows? It's a, ti it's a fun time travel show. But sometimes you will occasionally get actors who just happen to look an awful lot like their historical counterparts. Simon Callow is like an actual historian for Charles Dickens and with the right amount of makeup and costuming does look a bit like Charles Dickens in the artist's rendering of him. Ian McNeese, who played Winston Churchill in series 5 of Doctor Who, and would go on to play him in Big Finish, played Winston Churchill on the stage. That's why he was cast. He, ha he had a prerequisite of playing the role before, and also he happened to embody and look an awful lot like your stereotypical Winston Churchill, how the audience would perceive him. Shakespeare's bi-awakening. Shakespeare is basically now considered by people who study his work to have been bisexual. Like, he was married with a wife, but... I do think he laid with other men. Like, if you if you read Coriolanus, Coriolanus has a massive boy crush on his best friend. Hamlet loves Horatio way more than Hamlet's wife, okay? There's a lot of bi readings, a lot of bi implications in Shakespeare's work that, you know, history is straightwashed. Also, history tends to be whitewashed an awful lot. There's a reason why when Horrible Histories did that song years ago saying that, you know, people of colour have always been here. And by here, I mean in this country, the United Kingdom on this island years ago, centuries ago, like Roman times, there were Roman black soldiers as well. And when a GB News fake news propagator decided to have a bit of controversy, tweeted out the song and was like, oh, they're changing our history. Just like if they're not happy with actual historically accurate black representation in media, but they're also not happy with historical revisionism done for the fact of like, you know, play, having fun, colorblind casting in a, I must emphasize this, a two minute jokey pre credit scene where Isaac Newton discovers the theory of mavity, you can have fun with this. It reminds me a lot of the Davros controversy, in quotes, where I believe the people who were talking about it and signal boosting the story were deliberately abstracting it, deliberately removing it from context. The amount of people who seem to think that Davros has been forever rewritten in Doctor Who and the character has been permanently retconned from the classic series and other depictions in the revival as well because of the prequel Destination Scarrow for Children in Need is kind of mind-boggling. So much of the discussion around that Davros change is reliant on people not understanding that that episode that minisode is a fun prequel done for charity in the name of laughs and good humor and it's similar here it's just deliberate abstraction I'm sure that there are many people 
who have seen the fake news propagating and the anti-woke discourse around Isaac Newton, and maybe genuinely think that Doctor Who, last weekend, dropped an hour-long special historical episode with Isaac Newton as a main predominant character. And I think that that abstraction is part of the point. Why let the balance of probabilities get in the way of a good outrage article? Absolutely right, yeah. But it kind of shows just how little this current run of Doctor Who is giving reactionaries to work with. Like, it's the same 40 seconds from the Star Beast. It's this and a little throwaway line during Wild Blue Yonder. It's giving reactionaries and conservatives so little to actually latch on to that it's kind of breaking their brains a bit. You know, they've spent so long, like, grifting, so long just making stuff up in order to perpetually outrage people. And Doctor Who is giving them a, le a legitimate challenge in terms of things to legitimately be angry about it just seems that people genuinely seem to think that like russell t davis with davros has gone into their houses and their their dvd and blu-ray collections and has actively removed genesis of the daleks has actively removed destiny revelation resurrection and remembrance etc it'll be interesting to know like like it's not happened to me am i deliberately the last person on the list now as usual there is a conversation to be had about colorblind casting, you know, about changing the races and stuff. And I had so many people in our comment section and in, in on Twitter and stuff saying, oh, well, imagine if it was a Martin Luther King Jr. biopic and they cast uh, Ryan Gosling or whatever. But the thing is, is that because art and creativity is so malleable and so much of it is down to the creative vision, you actually maybe could get away with that in certain very specific context like i don't know a bloody rick and morty episode when rick and morty used the portal gun to go to a race swapped universe and it's actually you know white people who are trying to get civil rights from from like you know from black people who are in authority and stuff you know it could be done i i will like die on the hill that tropic thunder is a very good satire of this sort of like uh, is is one of the few contexts in which you probably could do blackface in the 21st century like it is like the one in 10 million example that you could maybe get away with doing something like that but also we don't, the comparison between let's do an episode based on martin luther king jr and let's do a fun two minute preamble with isaac newton for fun and giggles is so patently ridiculous to make that comparison on the face of it that it almost just re requires no response. Like, I, I think that the people who sincerely make this type of argument are not serious people. They're not smart people. They're not people who have... They are people who have not thought about their positions for more than 30 seconds, who in some cases might just truly be naive enough to think that race swapping in any direction is always okay in principle all of the time because sometimes it's done in terms of like casting traditionally white roles or white historical figures in a different light sometimes you know sometimes the context is correct and is fine and works or whatever but also like I, I think that there is a difference between a historical document a historically accurate documentary or biopic and the fun blue box show where David Tennant and Catherine Tate crash into a tree 1666 are you sir isaac newton you know the context here matters one thing to also consider though and like i said this is a, okay i'm aware that this is a topic in terms of racial representation and colorblind casting so i'm going to do the traditional white thing and center myself at the heart of it okay because that's what a good ally would do i'm kidding of course but you know I'm the one with the microphone right now. And I'm the one talking about this right now. So, when it comes to media depictions of historical figures, the deck is significantly stacked. History is a whitewash. A lot of the people who were not white are often erased from the history books or their stories are not frequently told because that's just how the because that's just how the racial power hierarchy in terms of who holds the power and who is and who is deprived of the power that's just kind of happened and that's had some very long lasting implications for example so much race swapping is happening in media in the 21st century because of multiple factors for example having a black actor play heimdall in the thor films or having a uh, black actor play little mermaid and you know things like that you know i'm generalizing 
the past 20 years of TV or the entirety of Hamilton. Kate Castle reviews us correct. So a lot of this sort of like race swapping or colorblind casting or whatever. A lot of that is happening because we live in late stage capitalism and tis a hellscape. Original projects, original movies, original media is a bit hard to come by right now because the big movie studios and the big entertainment studios do not want to take risks do not want to take risks, do not want to greenlight big original projects right now. So, how do you make adaptations different? How do you reflect the inherent diversity of our world, but with pre-made properties? Properties that were predominantly made in the 20th century. Superman, Batman, Doctor Who, so many franchises and pieces of media that we watch now and still watch and engage with in the 21st century, in 2023, were made in the 20th century and for a lot of the 20th century black people and people of color in general were not considered equal in the eyes of the law meaning that there wasn't a lot of media positively depicting them for a massive chunk of the century where entertainment and pop culture was becoming calcified into the form that we're watching and engaging with it now meaning that when these stories get adapted remade retold how do you reinvent superman a character who was invented by a pair of jewish men who were responding and reacting to nazi germany's stigmatization of jewish people how did they vent their frustrations how did they create an allegory for an outcast person in the early 20th century they created superman you know so it kind of makes sense as well to maybe recontextualize a traditionally white character like Superman and cast him as like Michael B. Jordan or whatever. You know, sometimes a race swap or a gender swap or something, it's just what the doctor ordered. And like I said, the theory of Mavity is not something that is particularly racialized. There's a difference between casting Nathaniel Curtis as Isaac Newton for a two minute pre-title skit in the vein of something like Horrible Histories or a full on let's do a racialized, heavily politically charged story and biopic about Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King Jr., for example. Mavity, to my knowledge at least, is not racialized. Martin Luther King or Muhammad Ali, these icons of the 20th century that have been used time and time again in terms of counterexamples for this sort of casting, at least as far as my twitter mentions and dms and emails and stuff has been you know as far as they're concerned you know there's a difference between such like a massively heavily racialized thing and also sometimes there will be a case of overcorrection and sometimes that overcorrection is coming from a good place and is coming from a place of there's not that many original black characters in the 20th century because for a big chunk of that century they weren't even considered equal in the eyes of the law so maybe let's fix that scale a little bit in the 21st century in some contexts like this, I think it's absolutely fine. Not to be that guy, but there are actual versions of Superman in the comics. Oh, you know, I, I'm not here to, like, you know, drop the mic on the Superman discussion or whatever. But when people were talking about why, you know, casting Michael B. Jordan to be rumoured as the next Superman or whatever. This is before James Gunn took over. You know, those rumours have been circulating for a while and people were getting angry at the idea of a black Superman. But sometimes these things translate really well you know and sometimes if you're going to be retelling these stories if you're going to be regurgitating and re recycling these franchises like james bond like star wars over and over again like doctor who then sometimes in order to tell a different story to recontextualize what's come before or, or analyze what's comes what's come before sometimes casting a woman or a person of color or maybe even like for example a disabled person in a traditionally able-bodied able role, can actually breathe new life into the material. One of the most interesting pieces of theatre over the past few years has been The Elephant Man on Broadway theatre, starring Bradley Cooper. And he does so without prosthetics on stage. He contorts his body and contorts his movements as if he did have the condition that Joseph Merrick had. Now, what if there was an adaptation of The Elephant Man where Joseph Merrick is the only person to be able-bodied on stage and everybody else is acting and moving their bodies around like the elephant man 
for example. Wouldn't that sort of like recontextualize the story? Wouldn't that recontextualize it? Obviously, you are changing the character. Joseph Merrick was not how we would perceive now to be an abled bodied person. But if you were to reverse the perspective, wouldn't it shine new light on the story, on the theatre production, on the play, on the character, on the adaptation? Doing Othello, where the titular Othello Shakespeare play is the only white person in the play. Wouldn't that recontextualize it? Would be an interesting it would be an interesting experiment. Sometimes media plays with these perceptions. It would say something about the material. It would take a play written by Bernard Pomerantz in the 1970s, a play that's been adapted numerous times for decades and decades, including the Bradley Cooper one in 2015. And it would recontextualize it and say something new about it. Maybe having Phoebe Waller Bridge as James Bond would do something similar. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that recontextualizing a play like The Elephant Man is the same as having Nathaniel Curtis as Isaac Newton do a two minute shtick before the broadcast of The Wild Blue Yonder, a story that then has nothing to do with Isaac Newton, okay? Obviously, it's different. But food for thought. Peter Dinklage did a good adaptation of uh, of Serrano changing the, his condition didn't change the meaning of the film. Yeah, wasn't the wasn't Serrano? I, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Wasn't that play about just a guy with a big nose, and then it's recontextualized in an adaptation with Peter Dinklage as a man with dwarfism, but they basically kept the script more or less exactly the same. Isn't that right? Can't forget John Hurt's portrayal of the rest of me. Oh yeah, John Hurt as uh, as Joseph Merrick. He, he's called John Merrick in the film uh, to you know further you know humanize him and make him a, a more relatable name. John is the bog standard human name. John Smith, Doctor, you know John. You know, Joseph, you know. But yeah, if you're going to be doing these adaptations, if you're going to be doing these changes and recontextualizing for modern audiences, but also wanting to reflect deeper meanings in the source material, there maybe is a film out there where there's a a Lady James Bond, a Jane Bond, if you will, where maybe there is a comment to be made about the how easy the promiscuity comes to James Bond, and maybe if perceived through a, a female lens, could be a little bit different. I saw someone's bit in their entire review of Wild Blue Yonder was at what's the point? The point of this story was to make Isaac Newton an Asian man. Can't make the point of. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like I said. There's a lot of people who I think are genuinely went away from the new cycle in the discourse thinking that this was the hour-long story wait it was using in pirate planet no there's a there's a call back in pirate planet one second pirate planet transcript so in pirate planet romana they talk about isaac newton and romana's like newton who's newton old isaac friend of mine on earth he discovered gravity well i say he discovered gravity i had to give him a bit, a bit of a prod what did he do? Climbed a tree and dropped an apple on his head. Ah, and so he discovered gravity. No, no, he told me to clear off out of his tree. I explained it to him afterwards at dinner. There's the TARDIS doctor. <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that's the retconned joke, apparently. Well, Blue Yonder means that Pirate Planet is not canon. It obviously is. Two things can exist at once. Thing is, would it be disrespectful to cast a white person as Mary Seacole? In a just bog standard retelling? Yeah, it would be. It would be erasing a field in that historical context, um, the accomplishments of a woman born, born in Jamaica? Where, where she, there's an, Mary Seagull has got a fascinating life. It needs to be documented more and talked about more. Two seconds. Crash course real quick. Was born in Kingston in the colony of Jamaica as a member of the community of free black people in Jamaica, etc., etc. Like, her race is actually quite, like, key to her story, you know? Extra Histories did a really good video on the life of Mary Seacole, whoops, multiple videos. I, I really recommend going through these as like a crash course of who Mary Seacole is. There are conversations to be had, but it's just people just like, p the people who are saying like, um, like earnestly and genuinely, oh, what if you race swap Martin Luther King Jr.? I'm not asking in good faith and they're stupid for asking those questions. Considering one major thing is that her achievements were semi ignored in favor of Florence. Yeah, that that's part of the story. That's part of her history and why there is the conscious effort to try and you know, recognize her own individuality. Race is important regarding most historical non-white people, but it is not important to most white people in history. Race is key to people of color stories because their life is made by however seen them. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So many stories. When was the last time, legit, 
quiz in the chat legit question i'll give you a second to think of this when was the last time you watched a biopic or read a biography or whatever of a real life person of color whose history whose life in like america and england and stuff was not about their race or heavily tied to their race like you know martin luther king jr heavy you know involved in civil rights Muhammad Ali, obviously heavily involved in terms of, like, the racial politics and civil rights and stuff. And I'm not just saying, like, oh, here's a super... Like, I'm talking about, like, maybe proper retellings or biographies. Like, there was that race film with Jesse Owens a few years ago. 12 Years a Slave. You know, um, Selma. The deck is skewed here. So, of course, there is an, a temptation, an instinct to maybe have a bit of fun with it. You know? It's a creative choice but like i said many of the people getting angry at this would be super angry and fuming and livid and furious if there's like a fictional black actor or black character or non-white character non-white actor etc like for example we even saw that gb news clip with uh, philip kisley a lecturer from the university of leeds saying that having black people on screen in doctor who specifically is like a bad thing because of social conditioning for children i wonder what he thinks about this Oh, we can't have a, a non-white actor playing Isaac Newton. Oh, but we also can't have a non-white actor playing a fictional character in a fantasy blue box TV show. Okay, so when are you happy with seeing non-white actors in media? When it comes to a show specifically like Doctor Who, which is not a historically accurate show. Like I said, Van Gogh did not stab an invisible chicken. When it comes to the ethos of Doctor Who, so much of it is just about inclusiveness and making sure that kids on the playground have got something fun to play with or can embody any role i think that it's a pure coincidence that uh the daleks had a sink plunger as their main weapon but it meant that you could have kids on the playground getting the plunger from from their mum's like you know upstairs cupboard and oh i'm a dalek now i'm a dalek let's get the whisk you know stuff like that on the playground with Shirley Ann Bingham, you can now have children who are differently abled, able to get involved and play Doctor Who for a bit. When there are kids on the playground who are doing the school play, here's historical figures, here's historical characters and stuff, here's people throughout British history. And let's say that play has, a, you know, a non-white five or six-year-old uh, gets up on stage, I'm Isaac Newton, I deserve the gravity, you know, honestly... Do you think there's going to be a single grown-up, some a single Mike Graham in the audience standing up and going, oh, What's that five-year-old kid's not white? We can't play Isaac Newton. I'm going to go grow concrete. You know, Do you think that's going to happen in a school play? No, because it's patently ridiculous to do. Why would you do it for Doctor Who? And obviously, there is a difference between a school play with five or six-year-olds and Doctor Who. In terms of the production, but in terms of the mentality, it's play. This opening two minutes is play. Do you think that kids on the playground, after the broadcast of The Wild Blue Yonder, were like, oh, did you see that Isaac Newton opening? Oh, let's, you know, let, let's go, let, let's go recreate that story. You know, let, let's go into the, on the school field and find a tree and let's, let's play that story that could have played out if the Doctor and Donna actually landed there. Do you think that those kids are going to be obsessed with the race of the actor who played Isaac Newton in that scene? No. And yes, as a white dude, and most importantly, a white Doctor Who fan, I can definitively say this ca this casting decision is okay. I say that partially jokingly, but if we are going with the idea that, you know, people of colour are the sole arbiters, the sole uh, people who are allowed to have influence on how they're depicted in media, then by that logic, I, as a pasty white dude, am okay with conceding white icon Isaac Newton for Doctor Who. You can have him. You give Rossi Davis the... I give him the white dude pass. I do it. I hand over my rice cake that he may have. My, <laughs> my Beatles help coaster. The most whitest pass of all. Russell can have this. There we go. He's got that now. Trying to balance it on the monitor. You can have that one. <laughs> okay. Come on. 
these conversations are ridiculous. I am mocking, you know, the, the premise of this, okay? Yes, your Mrs. Brown's Boys box set. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> I hereby give every white person in history to the person of colour. Give you, I do it. Me. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Mr. Tyler, so accuracy doesn't matter. I'll get behind an adaptation, but historically, I think you're right. We should have white for white people. In Doctor Who, there's leeway. In this, if this, like I said, I repeat myself, if this was an hour-long Isaac Newton story, probably. But I'm, I don't want to deal with these hypotheticals. I want to deal with the material reality that we've been given here. In the context of a two-minute preamble where Isaac Newton says mavity because he mishears the word gravity, it's fine. Come on, I want to have fun with the fun blue box show. Why do the Tories keep making it so difficult? <laughs>